much. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. I am delighted to be here uh, for this, this lecture series. I, I care a lot about these issues and particularly how the church is engaging and interacting with the culture in, in particular and these issues of, of reconciliation and God's economy of, of all things is, is really important to me. So I'm, I'm honored uh, to be here with you, with you tonight. I'd like to begin by addressing, or rather raising, an illustration of the current state of affairs that I believe that we find ourselves in today. In New York, there is a publication called The Village Voice. You may have heard of that, that publication. And there is a... There's a musician uh, by the name of, of Andrew W.K. who has a column uh, in the Village Voice. And several brave people will write Andrew W.K. a letter, sort of like a Dear Abby letter. And Andrew W.K., who minces no words, it's the Village Voice, so he says whatever he needs to say, responds to them. And I won't read the title... Uh, specifically because there's some profanity in it, and I'm at a seminary, and you're not supposed to do that. So I'll use a euphemism, and then you can use your imagination to fill in the blanks. <clears throat> this is a letter written uh, to Andrew W.K. in the Village Voice by a young man who has this really big problem, this really, really big concern that's, just, that's weighing on him quite, quite heavily. My dad is a right-wing a-hole. So he wants Andrew W.K. to help him with his father, who is this right-wing we're in. This is what he says. Listen to this. Hi, Andrew. I am writing because I can't deal with my father anymore. He's a 65-year-old super what right-wing conservative who has basically turned into a total you-know-what, intent on ruining our relationship and, and our planet with his politics. I'm more or less a liberal Democrat with very progressive values, and I know that people like my dad are going to destroy us all. I don't have any good times with him anymore. All we do is argue. When I try to spend time with him without talking politics or discussing any current events, there's still an underlying tension that makes it really uncomfortable. Don't get me wrong, I love him no matter what. But how do I explain to him that his politics are turning him into a monster, destroying the environment and pushing away the people who care about him. And Andrew W.K., this, this guitarist in this band, responds this way to Andrew. Dear son of a, of a right-winger, go back and read the opening sentences of your letter. Read them again. Then read the, then read the rest of your letter. Then read them again. Try to find a single instance where you refer to your dad as a human being, a person, or a man. There isn't one. You've reduced your father, the, the person who created you, to a set of beliefs and political views on how, and, and how it relates to you. You don't even consider your dad a person of his own standing. He's just your dad. You've reduced yourself to a set of opposing views and reduced your relationship with him to a fight between the two of you. The humanity has been reduced to nothingness, and all that's left in its place is an argument that can never be really won. And even if one side did win, it probably 
wouldn't satisfy the deeper desire to be in a state of inflamed, passionate conflict. The world isn't being destroyed by Democrats or Republicans, red or blue, liberal, conservative, religious, or atheists. The world is being destroyed by one side believing the other side is destroying the world. The world is being hurt and damaged by one group of people believing that they are truly better people than others who think differently. The world officially ends when we let our beliefs conquer love. We must not let this happen. And then he he concludes this letter by saying this to to the son of the right winger. Love your dad because he's your father. Because he made you, because he thinks for himself, and most of all, because he is a person have the, the strength to doubt and question what you believe so easily as you are so quick to doubt his own beliefs. Live with a truly open mind, the kind of open mind that even questions the idea of an open mind. Don't feel the need to always pick a side. And if you pick a side, pick the side of love. It remains our only real hope for survival and has the power to save us than any other belief we could ever cling to. Your friend, Andrew W.K. Now, when this was posted and published, it went viral. It exploded over the Internet. Because here you had this man who was, who was responding to his father being rebuked by someone in the village voice because his father's politics were simply being, that his father was simply being reduced to politics and he had forgotten that he was a person, a human, his dad. And I believe that the letter reveals a troubling trend that we find in our culture today that we are so ideologically polarized and tribal that we no longer love in general the beautiful that is contained in, in the nature of the human person, the human being. People are glorious wonders. They are works of art in motion. We treat people according to their tribal affiliations and we don't see them as persons. So the son of the right wing was told to love his father because his father was actually unlike him and different. You see, this is the nature of tribalism, namely that we love people conditionally. If they believe what we believe, then we love them. If they have the same enemies that we do, then we will love them. If we hate what they hate and love what they love, then they are worth our time, our our talents, our treasure, our affection, our love, and our care. So we put politics and principles often before people. Conservatives and progressives alike proceed the exact same way when thinking about social issues as, and a Christian response to those, it goes something like this that I explained earlier this morning. We pick our favorite political ideology and then we infuse random Bible verses into that ideology, declare it to be from God, and then those who don't agree with us are in fact then the enemy. And the essence of this evangelical tribalism is just saturated unfortunately, by the rhetoric of the gospel. Now, what's actually happened to us, Christians, even in the church, is that not, not only have we, have we made these distinctions and divisions on politics, that we've actually geographically moved ourselves into these tribes. Beginning in the 1960s, Christians began to sort themselves by political and social tribal lines. 
conservatives fled to the suburbs to justify building alternative safe communities for orthodoxy and the maintaining of American values in the suburbs while progressives remained in the cities. Conservative evangelicals found justification for, their, for, for the construction of these tribalistic enclaves in Donald McGavern's homogeneous unit principle and the church growth movement. But, and the power institutions then of evangelicalism, large churches, Christian colleges, seminaries, book publishers, the publishers that you can trust. These were all built on an infrastructure of tribal ideological homogeneity and safety from the evils of the tribal enemies who were not like us, those people who were thinking wrongly about the gospel, who didn't believe that the Great Commission was the central mission of Christianity, the people who got the gospel wrong and also got their politics wrong. You see, prior to the 1960s, Christians from different political parties and competing ideologies would actually be members of the exact same worshiping communities because churches were formed and shaped by people who lived in neighborhoods. And as we began to adopt the automobile as a form of making decisions for us about Sunday, we sorted ourselves so that progressives went to church with progressives and conservatives went to church with conservatives. And we began to be ghettoized, claiming, of course, that we have the gospel right. So today, if you look at the Protestant landscape, we primarily just want to be around Christians who are like us. And whatever that usness is, is the basis by which we point fingers at the other non-uses to evaluate their fidelity to the gospel and to, to ethics and justice. So Christian versions of, of this have, a simple, have, have essentially proof text secular political ideologies as a way of being Christian, as a way of thinking about society and social ethics. And to make matters worse, in some, in some areas there has been this reduction to Christianity to the doctrine of salvation so that the gospel is actually expected to do far more conceptual heavy lifting than it was intended to do. The gospel does not tell us whether or not we should have universal health care or free markets or the minimum wage. There are actually other principles in, in the field of social ethics in the Christian tradition that covers the prudential judgments that are needed to make sense of our socio-political realities. The Christian tradition, I believe, offers us something different, something better than the polarizing tribes that we have sorted ourselves uh, into today. A call to care about people because they are people. A call to look at the human person because he or she is made in the image and likeness of God and we care about their flourishing because God has ordered them to f and, and designed them to flourish in his world in a certain way. So among these principles that Christians have talked about for centuries, but we simply don't talk much about today, include the principle of solidarity, the principle of subsidiarity, which originated with Johannes Althusius, who wrote Politica in 1609. No one talks about subsidiarity much today in our circles. We also don't talk much about sphere of sovereignty, and, only, and often we only do that to quote Abraham's Kuyper his phrase about uh, uh, about every domain of, of the of the of the existence. Sorry about about excuse me. 
every domain in, 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 in all of existence coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so we also then have missed what many of us are sort of reintroducing into the Christian lexicon, particularly the evangelical space on these issues. And this is the theory of Christian personalism. A personalism in, in the Christian tradition focuses on the needs of the human person because persons are made in the image and likeness of God and are designed and ordered in specific ways to properly flourish within the context of God's redemptive plan for the entire creation. Personalism teaches us to love people because they are people, to value people because They are human persons, not because they are objects of some program or objects of some mission, but to realize that our neighbor is the one to whom we should, we ought to direct our love simply because they exist as persons. Now, as a theory, personalism emerged after World War I. It is as... As, work, as Thomas Work describes, a body of thought that began to emerge in Paris. And it emerged because of the recognition that ideological political tribalism is far more about discerning which tribe wins the culture war than it is determining what is best for people and determining ways in which people can flourish. That's not the concern. In fact, it unfortunately dehumanizes people and depersonalizes them for both political and economic ends. There was a crisis in France because there was no way to referee these competing ideas about and these issues regarding poverty and justice in the modern era. The principal exponent of personalism was a Frenchman by the name of Emmanuel Monnier devout Roman Catholic, Thomas Work explains the beginning of the movement this way. The personalist movement arose to challenge what it saw as the root causes of the crisis of modernity, at the center of which was the was, was a profound dehumanization, or better, depersonalization, which was taking place. The social order was dominated by economic and political mega processes and mega structures based on ways of thinking which abstracted from the person. End of quote. And these intellectual abstractions and, and these closed philosophical systems were getting policymakers nowhere fast. In fact, for Moliere, a person was a living center of creative activity, communication, and commitment who comes to know himself across the bridge of his action. Free, creative, and acting persons were to unity, to be in unity with the other, moving forward to create a society with structures and, and customs and institutions that are rooted in and, and those that revolved around the person as the center. Following World War I, there emerged variations on the theme of personalism. There was a more secularized version of personalism that developed at Boston University, which served as the hub of personalism for much of the 20th century. And while studying at Boston University, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reinserted personalism into his Christian thinking about social justice that changed America forever. Personalism played a determinative role in the structure of Dr. King's civil rights movement. It was the personalism of Pope John Paul II that played a significant role in bringing down the Soviet Union and for highlighting the ethics of abortion and euthanasia, this emphasis on human dignity. I would also argue that it was the personalism of Francis Schaeffer that led him to start Labrie, focusing on the questions that plague persons, valuing the individual uh, a person because they mattered as people. And after Schaefer, I would argue, the personalism as a part of the ways in which Christians engage society 
has, had essentially disappeared. And I believe that our current ideological bifurcation that's within Protestantism and more broadly and, and, sorry, and, 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 and more narrowly within evangelicalism has created this sort of crisis, a very similar crisis that Monnier faced in France after World War I, where our tribes matter more than people, our politics matter more than people, and we often lose the human person within the context of these, of our political battles over, over justice and truth. So Jesus commands his followers, as I mentioned earlier today, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and, the, and, and, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And typically, Christians have battled over the definition of who is my neighbor. But I believe there's a prior question to this question that we are challenged to think about, and it is simply this, what is a person? I mean, have you ever sat down and written out a definition of what makes a person a human being? What is it about human beings that, that makes us worthy of love and connection and, and makes us destined for certain ends? Not simply as means to gaining and maintaining political power, Sociologists like Christian Smith answer this question of what is a person this way. By person, Christian Smith argues that a person is a conscious, self-transcending center of subjective experience, durable identity, moral commitment, and social communication, who as the efficient cause of his or her own responsible actions and interactions, exercises complex capacities for agency and intersubjectivity in order to develop and sustain his or her own incommunicable self in loving relationships with other selves with and with the non-personal world. That's a short definition of what a person is. Now listen, it would take at least an hour to unpack the contours of this definition, but I believe it is a good one. Christians typically derive their understanding of what it means to be human rightly from what we know about the image of God, derivations on the attributes of God, those aspects that are communicable and those that are incommunicable, the ways in which we are like God and the ways in which we are not. Theologians like Berna Nona Harrison argues that humans are designed to unite their wills with God's will so that together with God, we can do good, good and creative things. We've been given minds which include reason and cognition the intellect perceives the material world through the senses and organizes and evaluates these perceptions. We've been given royal status, charged to be stewards over the whole creation. Moreover, humans have been given the capacity to use the arts to disclose beauty that is ultimately from God and to exercise practical creativity in crafts and architecture, manufacturing and technology, skills that enable the world's economy. Harrison believes that economic exchange and business enables humans to share with other people while producing the things that we need. And science shows us the patterns of, and systems of God's world that point us to his character as sustainer and planner and designer and so on. That all of these facets point to our royal, that our status is, is royal humanity. And that salvation frees us to practice virtues like self-control and courage and love and mercy and justice in the application of God's design for humanity. So what? 
Why is talking about the human person important? Because instead of embracing ideologies as a way to think about human flourishing, what if we actually built our theories about politics and economics from the person up? What if we begin with the attributes of the human person and thought about the sorts of economic and political and social structures derive from the attributes of the human person that allow persons to flourish. That we're not concerned about winning the culture war, we're not really burdened by having a political ideology win, but we want people to be what God has created people to be and to do. It's simply to remember that when you see an individual you actually don't see an individual, you see a person. Persons are not individuals by definition. Persons are interdependent and integrated into the social fabric of our humanity, into the social fabric of community. And they are derivatively dependent on the natural world. Humans center their lives around particular ends on purpose. Humans are not individuals living for the pursuit of rights. Humans are persons living in pursuant of vocation in a divinely ordered world. In the Christian tradition, persons are not means to political ends. They're not means to economic ends. They're not means to achieving even evangelistic goals. They are not means to growing churches. They are not means of winning Culture war battles, persons are ends in themselves because of their permanent connection to a triune creator for eternity. So as persons, we think about ourselves and we look inwardly, we embody spiritual, sorry, we are embodied spiritual beings permanently connected to the transcendent. We have capacity to care for others deeply and we desire to do so. We engage the world through our senses, persons are unique and irreplaceable. No two people have ever been exactly alike and never will be just alike. Humans are not repeated. We even have capacity to make moral evaluations of ourselves and others. In fact, we are necessarily social. We are individuals and persons, <clears throat> sorry, as, as persons, we can only know ourselves in relationship and in connection to others. We cause things to happen in the world beyond instinct with intentions oriented around future perceived outcomes. Humans want to love and to be loved. We, we crave connection. I promise you that within two minutes of the end of this lecture, you're going to check your cell phone for text messages and email because we crave connection. We can't stand not being connected to people. So there is no such thing as a person outside of relationships with others. It's what our lives are about. We want to feel like we belong to others and that we're making meaning in life with other people. When people are viewed as merely individuals, what we want for them is set in terms that ultimately depersonalize them. Individuals become abstractions to be theorized about in a materialistic framework as economic or political entities. So when we began to think of the meaning of the person apart from, from the scriptures, apart from revelation, a lamentable set of abstractions begin to pervade our thinking, which leads us to depersonalization. Graphically seen in much of our social contract theory where persons are viewed in, in, in relationship to their being autonomous, self-directing individuals. 
a social ethics centered around person, relationship, and community is replaced by an endless principle of unresolved conflicts between claims based on rights on behalf of individuals and claims based on the utility and power of the state. So what the Bible does then is it tells us how God, the infinitely free, created human persons and entered into explicit relationship with them so that they could attain the end for which they were created. This is what God's people living everywhere really care about. How people are attaining the end for which God created human persons to attain. As a result, Christians over the centuries have said no to things that undermine the ends for which God created persons, living in relationship to God and others, regardless of which political party or political ideology makes the proposal. So we, are, so we arrive at a different type of question when we think of the person as the center. And it is simply this, again, what relationships, what structures, what institutions, what processes are necessary for human beings to be what God created them to be and to do because they are persons, conscious, self-transcending centers of subjective experience. And my friends, neither the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or whatever your favorite party is can answer that question. Nor can any political ideology in the West divorced from revelation that naturally presupposes the autonomy of the individual can arrive at this conclusion, can arrive at answers to this particular question. The, this cannot be answered, has never been answered by politics. So then why is it that, that for much of, of recent history, the last 50 to 60 years, what Christians have done is simply sought ways to justify a political ideology that might fit with their understanding of the Christian tradition. So we want to move forward. We want to do something different. We want to ask these different questions with the person as the center. Understanding that, beyond, that behind the politics are real people made in the image and likeness of God. So when you're in the checkout line, if you don't do the self-checkout, and you see a, and you're looking in the face of the cashier who is, who is helping you with your transaction, what do you, what do you see standing in front of you? When you sit across the table from someone with whom you disagree, what do you see? Every encounter with a human person is an opportunity for liberation. It's an opportunity in union with the other to explore together what it means to be truly human as God designed. And this does not and cannot happen if we are only with people who are like us. One of the culturally subversive aspects of the early church is that they had a love for people that transcended the, the cultural norms of their era. They loved people who were different than them. They loved the marginalized and they loved the outcast, the sick and the rejected. People that they had no reasons to love, they, they loved those people. And today, whether you are a Christian conservative or a progressive or somewhere in the middle, 
You love people not because they are different from us, but because they are like us. So for this reason, I've arrived at some deep concerns about where, in fact, we are headed as Protestants, particular evangelical Protestants. I'm wondering if whether or not it's a good idea for us to be encouraging Christians to pursue relationships with important people. Insiders. People that have sort of social and political capital and leverage. I often find that racial reconciliation is more about the rhetoric of, the diver- of diversity than the reality of it. It's about a program. It's about a photo opportunity. And what I tend to find is that wedding photos tell you the real story about whose who's peop- who, who's, um, uh, who's people's uh, friends really are. Look at who's in the wedding party. There's the rhetoric and then there is the reality. When your diverse friendships are, are exclusively with those whom you hold power over, you may not be achieving what you think. Our rhetoric about loving the city, which is often nothing more than a smokescreen for justifying the pursuit of a lifestyle, where serving the poor is done to assuage the guilt of gentrification. Perhaps we're missing the mark in in terms of what it means to love our neighbor. So we still move to neighborhoods where people are like us. Now we're just doing it in cities. Homogeneity along the axis of lifestyle preference is no difference from homogeneity on the basis of politics or residential safety. In the 1980s, The cool people were the suburbanites, but today the cool people are the city city dwellers. Same idolatrous, pathetic church planting strategy, but different zip code. So we love ideas, but have very little interest in loving actual people. There's also developing today in in the Christian subculture, this sort of Christian elitism where all sorts of secret meetings of of emerging leaders get together to focus on raising up influencers to plant churches with influential, important people. I have concerns that the only vocations we tend to honor in the work vocation space are the important, prestigious ones. I would love to see a faith and work conference where they brought a truck driver up to talk about his faith at work. But what do we typically call up? The the, the lawyer, the architect, the the business professional. I'm wondering, are we missing the person? I want the, the, the manager of an office max to stand up here and talk about faith and work. Why are we so concerned about being with the, the, the movers and shakers? And so it's strange to me that the pastors we, we value the most are the ones who, who have these important churches with important people, but they're the ones who spend the least amount of time with actual people. Because there isn't much emphasis on on being servants and washing the feet of those who are considered outcasts and on the margins because they are humans, we forget that the poor aren't people that we do ministry to. They're people that we should want to become our friends and our peers. Not just objects of programs and parachurch ministries and nonprofits of whom we need no new ones. Depersonalized Christian elitism thinks of loving the poor exclusively in terms of something that we should be doing to to them. 
instead of thinking about ways in which because they're friends and peers that we come into each other's lives and, and homes and, and, and families, not some outreach ministry. So personalism, however, is concerned that we see those different from us as humans in whom we have an opportunity to be in an intimate communion with them as peers. In churches in our cities, model on, on personalism, on the personalism that we see in the New Testament. And as we saw our practice in, in the early urban churches, you would have in our common understanding, white collar workers and blue collar workers on the same pew. Kids in the foster care system and true orphans and kids from more intact affluent families would be in the choir together. Christian personalism shows the world that because our neighbors are people, not simply because they are like us, they are worthy of love and connection and relationship. They are worthy, they are worthy of mutuality that establishes a context by which we can speak truth into the life of the other, to love and to be loved by another so that that other person can be what God has designed them to be because they are our peers and our friends. I've argued in other places that one of the ways in which you can discern your tribalism is to think about it this way. Think of the person that you would, you would be afraid for your child to marry. That, that, that would cause you to hemorrhage if, if your daughter brought a guy like that home. And whomever that person is, that's the person you need to be hanging out with. That's the person that you need in your kitchen. Those are the kinds of people, because we love people, that you want to move toward, not only for their flourishing, but so that they can actually be a blessing to you as well. These are the kinds of people that Christian personalism encourages us to be around so that your children look at you and they ask you this question. Why are we friends with them, mommy? That your neighbors and your relatives are, are confused. Like, why would you want to be friends with people like that? It should beg the question. Why are you having those people over for dinner? In fact, why are you going over to that neighborhood to go into that apartment to be with those kinds of people? Remember, you moved away from them on purpose. So personalism challenges us to, to model our lives after a Christ who spent time and died for sinners who were not like he spent time with people and loved them and entered into explicit relationships with them so that they could attain the end for which they were created. So we want then for people is not to simply fulfill some political vision that we prefer, but for them to flourish. As God has designed in every aspect of what it means to be human, here and now and in the world to come. So we love people because they are people. We love our neighbors because they are people. We want to connect with, with, with persons on purpose because they are different from us. And we ultimately do this because we have been formed and shaped in love by a God who did this to us first. So as we move forward as, as evangelicals, my dream is for us to be recognized as a people who do things differently, that they're crazy people. 
that they're friends with people that they're not supposed to be friends with, that they live with people they're not supposed to live with, that they marry people they're not supposed to marry. They let their kids play with people they're not supposed to let their kids play with, that, that they visit those that they're not supposed to, to be with, and that people will ask us, why are you doing this? And you simply respond because Jesus commands me to love God and to love my neighbor because my life is characterized and shaped first and foremost by this call to love. And my estimation is that when God's people are characterized and stereotyped as a people that are driven to be in relationships because they love people, that perhaps, just perhaps, possibly, maybe, maybe, just maybe, will be the kinds of people, the kinds of communities that even though people are not Christians themselves, they'll want to praise and give glory to God. Thank you very much.